Welcome back to Podcast Royal. How are you today and how was your long weekend? We're recording as we always do on Tuesday, which feels like a Monday. So how was your long weekend? My long weekend was great. I celebrated my dad's birthday and um, I'm especially in a good mood today because Trader Joe's had peonies for sale and I got some pink ones yesterday Mm. and they are brightening up my bedroom. So I'm really, I love this time of year when all the flowers are in bloom and I cannot say no when I see the peonies at Trader Joe's. (laughs) So how are you doing? I'm good. We had a good getaway. Um, We just spent one night in St. Augustine, which is about an hour and a half from where we live. And it was nice to get out of town for a minute. I love the water. The water is my happy place. So being near the water is just always my favorite way to spend any time, honestly. So I feel really relaxed, which is not something that I think I have said much this year. So I feel, I feel good. I feel good. And we have a lot to talk about, but I don't think it's too overwhelming because you'll talk about this in a minute, but randomly we have like a huge break in Royal engagements. So we'll, we'll get into all that, but before we do get into the Royal rundown, rundown, I can't speak. I wanted to say thank you to our listener Roggenhild for DMing us on Instagram and sharing with us that Queen Sonia's coral dress, which we spoke about, Jessica dropped a photo in our Google Doc, which of course listeners you can't see, but we did talk about the coral dress last episode is actually a rewear. So Queen Sonia wore it for the first time as far back as 1992 to the occasion of Queen Margrethe and Prince Henrik's 25th wedding anniversary. So we love fascinating tidbits like this so thank you and also i want to say another thank you to our listener maria jessica this is huge this is a huge milestone (laughs) for getting us over the 1000 follower count on instagram maria actually dm'd us and was like it was me i was the one that did it which is good because there's actually one right behind her too so we love you maria for being our 1000th (laughs) follower remember us talking about that last week i think we're at 992 and now we are at 1000 so thank you maria and uh yeah with all of that said shall we get into it because we do have quite a full episode this week First off, I want to send our condolences to the British Royal Air Force and the family of the RAF pilot who lost his life in a plane crash over the weekend. He was flying a World War II British fighter plane. It was used during the Battle of Britain, and the report did say he was the only one involved in the accident. I believe an investigation is being launched to determine what actually led to the crash. But the Prince and Princess of Wales did share a message to the public. And their message said, incredibly sad to hear of the news this afternoon from RAF Coningsby. Our thoughts this evening are with the pilot's loved ones, the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight, and the wider RAF family, WNC. So if you aren't familiar with that location... RAF Coningsby is in Lincolnshire, and um, the pilot involved in the crash was squadron leader Mark Long. He was a typhoon pilot. He served with the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight for four years, and we are really, really saddened to hear that news. Yeah, that that is absolutely devastating news, and, and I'm so sorry to hear about that. We are sending all the love to his family and friends. Absolutely. Well, Rachel, you did say at the start of the episode that uh, we may have had some scheduling changes or a lighter June coming up. So let's go ahead and explain that a little bit more. Um, I will say last week we saw some engagements canceled, but our our episode somehow I think will be just as long as ever. (laughs) So um, Maybe, Maybe they will get shorter if the engagements keep getting canceled. We'll see. (laughs) Well, we had some unexpected political news from UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak. So Sunak called for a general election on July 4th. So if you're wondering, what does that exactly mean for us royal watchers? So aside from the fact that King Charles could potentially welcome a third prime minister already this soon into his reign, we are expecting to see, like we said, some royal engagements postponed just as we were gearing up for what we thought would be a very busy June. Mm-hmm. Um, we had, you know, engagements started getting canceled last week. And then uh, so far, we are looking ahead at the summer and there are some things on the calendar that are still to be determined. But the general consensus is anything that might interfere with the election 
if it's something that would draw attention away from it, or maybe cause the royals to look like they're impacting political opinion one way or the other, swaying anything. Those types of events would be postponed so that they don't conflict with, uh, you know, the election going on. But then some of our bigger royal events that we expect each year are likely to still go forward. So, for example, Trooping the Color and Royal Ascot will probably still see those on the diary. Uh, but unfortunately, the Japan state visit might be postponed. And the reason being is state visits like this often involve government officials or politicians um, in some way or another, or they could, you know, appear to lean that way. Uh, so it could be deemed inappropriate to have an event like that during the election. So we'll have to wait and see what happens. My guess is that it will be postponed, but I want to know what your prediction is, Rachel. Yeah, I think your thinking is right on the state visit. And, you know, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, I think that, as you said, this has turned from an incredibly busy June, I mean, like staggeringly busy to a potentially very slow June. I know that the King and Queen said they'd still be keeping their visit honoring D-Day in June on the calendar. William will do a separate visit honoring D-Day as well, the 80th anniversary of that next month. But I, I kind of do expect what was a very full month to empty out, which I know will make Camilla happy as I read that she thinks the king who is a known workaholic that's not a secret is overexerting himself since his return on April 30th to public duty this will of course also allow William extra family time it just continues it continues to be such a strange 2024 and we will see what happens but I'm really not expecting much in the way of royal engagements for the next six weeks and I kind of wonder if the king and William are a bit relieved because both of them canceled engage, I'm sure they hate to miss these engagements, but I know William surely wants more family time. He always wants more family time and the king could probably use a little bit slower pace right now as he is still receiving treatment for cancer. So we'll see, yeah. but June just went from being, I mean, I think we've even said on the show in the past couple of weeks, like June is going to be insane, but I mean, July 4th is still five and a half weeks away, so it might just, it might really slow down. So we'll see. So speaking of Prime Minister Sunak, so I want to talk about um, how uh, this national service requirement. So speaking of the upcoming general election, Rishi Sunak announced that his party, which is the UK's conservative party, has plans to revive national service, which honestly, I'm not familiar with. Uh, I'm uh, no spoiler alert here, not a British citizen. But this this means for those that may not know that 18 year old citizens of the UK are required to participate in mandatory service either in the armed forces or through volunteer work in the community. So the Conservative Party confirmed to The Telegraph that children in the British royal family, so George, Charlotte, Louis, uh, Peter's children, Zara's children, Beatrice's children, Eugenie's children, all of them would not be exempt from this requirement and would be expected to take part in it. And according to the BBC, the plan would see 30,000 out of an estimated 700,000 18 year olds spend a year in the military in areas like logistics, cybersecurity, civil response operations, or procurement. And then the rest, i.e., me, if I were a British a citizen and 18 years old, would spend one week in a month volunteering for a year to fulfill this requirement. So I, I just found out about this today. So, and I, and I think it's relatively breaking news. So do you have any thoughts on this? Well, I was surprised by this news. I don't follow UK politics very closely. So I'm not sure if this has been a big topic of discussion over there or not, you know, but I didn't expect the announcement. I will say, I know it's something a lot of other countries do and many of our European royal children do enroll in military service for a brief period before they move into their full-time working royal roles. Um, but I was wondering, what's the cutoff there? So if they enact this law mm -hmm. and you're 18, um, is there an age where you would be exempt? Like, you know, if it was if it was enacted tomorrow and you and I were living in the UK and we were, you know, citizens living there, 
would we be exempt because of our age or is I it? I think so. I mean, I don't know. I don't, I don't follow maybe UK it, politics maybe either. I think it's just starting, like UK, starting, yeah, starting at, now. at age 18 and then yeah. going from that point, maybe. Yeah. yeah. And listeners, we, you know, if you're, if you're British or if you just know UK politics would love to know, you know, when the national service requirement ceased. And uh, I would, I mean, I don't know, but I would assume that, uh, that it would start with, current 18 year olds you wouldn't have to like they wouldn't backlog it like if I'm 37 like backlog like now you have to do this um although it kind of would I mean more volunteering is not a bad thing but I I would assume that it would start with current 18 year olds in the UK and just go forward but um but I don't know for sure and speaking of if if Prime Minister Sunak does get um elected out of office to have three prime ministers in under two years that's that's a lot of change that's a lot of upheaval so we'll see what happens july 4th is an interest i mean as the american like you're obviously we're both american but as americans that's an interesting day to have a a a general election but that they they're not thinking about july 4th in the uk because it doesn't matter to them but i digress so let's let's talk a little bit more about Charles, William, and even George. So to mark the first anniversary of Charles's coronation, the king accepted a patronage at Gordonston, which of course, if you follow the royal family, as I'm sure you all do, otherwise, why would you be here? That's where he attended secondary school. And he described Gordonston, in his words, as an absolute hell. So that's interesting that he has accepted this patronage with Gordonston, but it is his alma mater. So then, so after canceling royal duties as Jessica just said William and George George was a surprise stepped out for a great father-son outing this past Saturday to watch fierce rivals Manchester City and Manchester United compete in the FA Cup final so William is the president of the Football Association or FA which is the governing body of soccer in both England and Wales we don't have to tell you listeners he is a huge soccer fan George is as well so the match was held at Wembley Stadium in London and he got to award the trophy to the winning team which was Manchester United who beat Manchester City two to one did you see photos from that I'm sure you did I did yes it was fun watching them shake hands with everyone and cheer during the game so I've seen some pictures where people are noticing that George has this tick where he where he smooths his hair back that Mm -hmm. Kate does and and it's true she does it he does it and it's just very like it's just so interesting how we adopt without even probably realizing it, the mannerisms of our parents and those we love. But speaking of George, William shared at the garden party last week, a week ago today, that George has career aspirations of becoming a pilot, which really isn't a huge surprise because George has been interested in aviation for almost all of his life. And he comes about it honestly, as William was, of course, a search and rescue helicopter pilot before he leaned full time into his royal role. And William also at the garden party gave insight into Louis's bedtime routine. He accepted, a ch- I think this is really sweet, accepted a children's book called Homewards, which is named after William's charity of the same name. The person that gave it to him said there were only 10 copies. I feel like you should print more copies. Like, I feel like that would sell just saying, I mean, I'm no marketing expert, but print more than 10 copies. I think that book would sell. And, wow. um, and William told those gathered that he would be reading the children's book homewards to Louie later that evening. So I think that's really sweet because Louie is still getting his bedtime story. That is really sweet. Rachel, let's talk about another publication. So Last week, you told the class all about King Charles' latest portrait, and we (laughs) thought that was controversial. Well, this week, the Princess of Wales has a new portrait, and I have to say, it's pretty controversial as well. (laughs) Uh, So when I saw the, the portrait first revealed in this publication that we're about to talk about, my reaction was much like the one of Prince Charles portrait and that I knew the comment section was going to be full of very strong opinions. So art is a- polarizing. People have thoughts. Yes. So for the past three years, the magazine Tatler has commissioned cover art for their July issue depicting a British Royal. So beginning in 2022, the cover was of Queen Elizabeth in celebration of her platinum Jubilee. And then in 2023, it was King Charles in honor of his coronation. And now July 2024 is the Princess of Wales, whom the artist says has really risen up to her role. 
So this July issue is apparently the completion of Tatler's Royal cover art series. I think they're calling it the Royal Triptych. Um, and it was not, I do want to clarify, it was not a piece commissioned by the royal family. Catherine did not sit for the painting. It was obviously. Actually, <laughs> no, it was commissioned by Tatler. And the artist had to use images of Catherine to create the piece. Um, it's also not the same artist that did art for the previous covers. So the ones of Queen Elizabeth or King Charles, just to make that clarification, I don't know if everyone understood that, but different artists have been highlighted each year. So in 2022, it was an artist from Nigeria. Then in 2023, it was an artist from Trinidad. And then lastly, this year, it was the piece was done by British Zambian artist Hannah Uzor. So before we go any further, I have a picture here in our notes, Rachel, and it's also on our Instagram account, I believe, if anyone wants to go look. I can't remember if I put it in our stories. I think I might have just put it in our stories. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, I want to know your thoughts on the picture. Okay. <laughs> um, well, so art is so tough. Like it's so polarizing and, and I don't, I mean, actually I do really like to paint, but I'm not good at it and I'm not trying to be an artist, but you know, we were talking about the King's portrait and I said in that, I think that was last episode that it's very difficult to get the face right, which to his credit, Jonathan Yeo did, I think get the King's face right. Although it was a very red portrait, but that's what's missing in this portrait from Tatler is that they did not get the artist did not get the face right with with Kate. The artist is clearly very talented. I mean, look at the detail on the hands. I, I can't pinpoint exactly what it is that is just so not uh, not Kate. I think maybe it's the nose. I'm not totally sure, but this this is not Kate to me in the face. Anyway, the rest of it. Sure. But I'm wondering what you think. I agree with you. The recognizable feature for me is really the white dress and the blue sash. I mean, yeah. I think if you put this face on any other outfit and you removed the tiara, I don't think I would know who it was. Um, and, and, you know, I think another part of this is it's lacking details or I don't know if nuances are the right word that, you know, really do make a person recognizable. I think there are some subtle familiarities, but it's almost like the piece isn't developed enough. Like it, it's not finished or something. So the whole face hasn't come together in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Um, I, so I really wanted to know what our followers on Instagram thought about it. And I put a question box up and I almost shared the responses on Instagram, but I decided I wanted to wait and share them here first. So I'm going to read it. a handful. I've got quite a few that I saved here. So first, I do want to point out, we did have an artist respond. So I'm really happy about that. And they said, portrait artist here, a nice piece artistically, but does not capture the Princess of Wales likeness. Yes, that's well said. That's well said. Yes. Uh, so some other comments, doesn't capture her beauty. It's not her face, question mark. <laughs> All of these portraits and paintings they never paint her face. Right. That is true because they never could get Kate quite right in a portrait. I've never seen a portrait painter get Kate right in the face. That is that is true to that listener. We also have Catherine is much prettier than that. It looks nothing like her. Doesn't look much like her. Does not look like her. <laughs> uh, my second favorite comment of the whole thing is it's better than the Kings. <laughs> And my oh. personal favorite response we got was, it's a beautiful portrait of someone, just not Princess Catherine. <laughs> oh, that's also well said. It's a beautiful woman. That's just not Princess Kate. Like, that's not the Princess of Wales, you know? And so <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, that's it. It's just like, that could be any woman. There's no, yeah, the detailing is not there. And I mean, I think they're like, other than the, other than the face, which is the focal point, the portrait is fine. I mean, obviously it's a talent, as I said, it's a talented artist, but yeah, I mean, it's just, they, it, but the other commenter is correct. I've never seen, and I think there's been three that I can think of now portraits painted of Kate that they never can get her quite right. Do you agree with me? Do you know what I'm talking about? The one where she's wearing the vampire's wife dress, which we'll actually talk about in a minute. And then the other one of just like her face, it's just a, a face portrait and they just can't ever nail it. Mm -hmm. I would agree. 
I don't know. But anyway, so before we jump from one Princess of Wales to another, I want to talk about Kate for one second. So she has reportedly been seen out and about, though we still don't know when her return to public duty would be it will be. And I and I hope that she's not rushing it. I mean, I hope that she is taking all the time that she needs to you know, get better, get healthy, get to a, a, a place where she feels fully ready to return and then and only then come back. But I have heard the fall for her return. I've heard 2025. I've heard her diary is completely empty for the rest of the year. Who knows? We'll see. But let's talk about the Princess of Wales of yesteryear. So I remember us actually reporting on this Princess Diana photo exhibition when it was in the U.S., but a photo exhibition displaying some of Diana's most well-known moments, including, for example, her moment in front of the Taj Mahal, is returning home to London after a three-city tour in the U.S. So this exhibition includes 75 life-size prints and features the work of three photographers from one family, Anwar Hussein and his son, Samir and Zach. So Anwar is a very well-known, they all are, but Anwar has been at this, I think he's been doing this for like 40 years. And he took some of the most famous images of Diana, Samir and Zach photographed more modern royalty, like William, Kate, Harry, Meghan. So collectively, the three have spent over four decades photographing the royal family. And their show is called Princess Diana, accredited access exhibition. And it is being described as an immersive walkthrough 60 minute experience. And now it's coming home to London. So lucky London. And speaking of photos, a photo of Harry and Meghan that it was taken by a photographer and also their personal friend, Misan Harriman, has made it to the National Portrait Gallery, which is a big deal. So this photo is a black and white shot and shows the couple from the side. They're holding hands before they took the stage at the One Young World Summit in Manchester, England. The photo was taken on September 5th, 2022 which of course was just three days before her late majesty died and Harriman shared the news on Instagram and shared it will be part of the permanent collection there. I'm not sure if it's actually up yet, but it's going to be. So um, all kinds of, I, I trust a photo more than I trust a portrait. We're talking about all the, all the photos, mm -hmm. all the portraits, all the things, but I'd mentioned the vampire's wife briefly just a second ago. I want to talk about this. So the vampire's wife is shutting down, which is really yeah. upsetting. And I want to get your thoughts on this. And, you know, anyone who has followed Kate and Beatrice's fashion, including you listeners of the podcast, we've talked about the vampire's wife many times on the show before, you know, the brand, the vampire's wife, perhaps they're most known for the glittery sparkly dresses worn by both of those women over the years. And as I just kind of alluded to a second ago, a green gown worn by Kate that is by the vampire's wife was actually immortalized in William and Kate's first joint portrait together. So she wore that green dress appropriately to Dublin back in 2020. I know you can picture this dress in, in your mind, Jessica. And then she wore a pink, the vampire's wife gown while she and William were on tour in Belize back in 2022. So Susie Cave, who is the founder of The Vampire's Wife, announced this past week that the brand would be closing. She wrote, after 10 years as the creative director of The Vampire's Wife, it is time to say goodbye. So Beatrice has been seen in the looks. She really loves The Vampire's Wife. She wears the brand all the time. Other celebrities like Kate Moss, Kira Knightley have worn the brand. And, you know, I just hate to hear of any fashion brand closing and a statement further continued that despite a period of positive growth in sales, the upheaval in the wholesale market has had dramatic implications for the brand. So I know in particular, Jessica, that you like the vampire wife's style and aesthetic. So were you surprised to hear news of it shutting down? Cause I know I was. I was yes. And I do love this brand. I think their dresses are so gorgeous. And, you know, something interesting about this brand, I noticed that their styles are very distinctly vampire's wife. So mm -hmm. by that, I mean, you can easily identify pieces from this brand. I, I personally feel like I've not seen a ton of variety um, outside of some of those very recognizable styles. And I don't know if that worked in their favor or if it hurts the prospect of repeat customers, you know? Yeah. So like if you already own a dress by the vampire's wife, are you likely to purchase multiple given the resemblance mm. between a lot of their styles? Um, I know if you're a royal or you have a very large budget, maybe so. But um, I, I don't know. It doesn't sound like that had you know, maybe any reason to do with, with what's going on and why they're shutting down, but it is sad to hear because they make some really gorgeous pieces. Mm -hmm. So, um, mm -hmm. I, I don't know. 
I know you were surprised as well. Very, very surprised because I, you know, I've seen them, the vampire's wife worn so many times by royals and celebrities. And you're right. I mean, the pink dress and the green dress are the Kate wore were basically indistinguishable from one another. Maybe the sleeves are slightly different, but that the vampire's wife was never really my personal style, but I really loved the way it looked on Kate and Beatrice in particular. So that is just sad. I just, I hate to hear of any business closing because you put so much of your heart into this and, so that's, that's, that's hard. So, but you're right. They do have a very, like, you know, that that is a vampire's wife look when you see it. Well, let's switch gears a little bit here. So Edward and Sophie have been to Scotland and I do want to chat about that. I put this in our notes to mention and Rachel, I know when you went to London, you traveled to Scotland for a few days, right? I did. And I need to go back because that's where I got COVID. So I got one <laughs> full day of in, Scotland, in the Scottish Highlands, which was one of the best travel days of my life. And then I spent the remaining three days in my bed with COVID while my friend, Stephanie, my travel partner on that trip, who is not a royal watcher, went to Edinburgh Castle alone, went to uh-huh. Britannia alone. And I'm like, I'm, I would do anything to go. So I obviously need to go back. But yes, I've been to Scotland and it's beautiful. Um, I have not been to Scotland. It's it's on my list, but I do follow someone on Instagram. Her name is Caroline McQuiston, and she lives in Scotland. Specifically, she is located in the Isle of Skye, and I really love her content. Um, I mean, her pictures of Scotland are just so pretty. It looks so peaceful there. But I knew exactly where the Duke and Duchess of Edinburgh were when I heard that they visited the Isle of Skye last weekend or last week sometime. And when they were in Scotland, they also visited the Isle of Tyree and the Isle of Cull. Um, And so I wanted to chat about this a little bit because I was kind of excited about it. But I saw Prince Edward there sporting knee-high socks and a kilt in some photos. Very Scottish of him. Uh, But I learned some fun facts during their visit. So I want to share those here because I thought it was kind of cool. So the Isle of Call is quite small. And I did not mean to rhyme that. But (laughs) nevertheless, um, it is... 13 by 3 miles, and it has a population of 171 people. What? I've yeah. never even heard of the smallest town being that. That's very tiny. <laughs> well, there's only one primary school there, and it only had six children enrolled in the whole school. Yeah. Um, and so once the kids reach high school age, they have to actually travel to the mainland of Scotland for classes. Um, They also teach the Gaelic language in both primary and high school in the Highlands area and and Isles of Scotland. But while Edward and Sophie were on their visit, the six school children in the Isle of Cole sang in Gaelic for the Duke and Duchess. I thought that was really sweet. Um, And I was just thinking, man, if I do happen to plan a trip to Scotland, I would love to spend some time on the Isles. I think that would be a really fabulous trip. I have never seen anywhere more beautiful in my entire life than than Scotland. It is it's majestic. I can see why that was the late Queen Elizabeth's favorite place in the world. And I, I want to put this in here. Speaking of Sophie, this past Sunday, Sophie actually wrote an article in the Sunday Times called Diary of My Secret Trip to Ukraine. So in this piece, she wrote, since returning to the UK, many people have said how brave or courageous I was for going. I am neither. The brave people are those who have endured extreme violence and survived. The courageous are those who have reported the crimes committed against them. So I thought that was about the most Sophie thing Sophie could have ever said. And yet another reason why we love her on Podcast Royal. She is so selfless. So um, very briefly, I want to mention this before we move on. We are at Podcast Royal, of course, very aware that Hugh Grosvenor, who is one of the richest men in the UK, he's the seventh Duke of Westminster. He is getting married on June 7th to Olivia Henson. So the Duke of Westminster is actually one of the very few friends of William and Harry who has remained close to both of them since 
well, since, how, how do you even put that? Since everything, since the fallout. And so since the rift, so this is supposed to be the wedding of the year. Last year's wedding of the year was the Jordanian Royal wedding. This is supposed to be the wedding of the year in 2024. Don't worry. We're going to cover it when it happens. William is set to be an usher. Harry is reportedly not attending. That could change. I don't know though. Hugh is the godfather of Prince Archie. So we'll see what happens, but consider us monitoring the situation, if you will. Yes, he was also the godfather of Prince George. That's correct. You are correct. Good call out. Well, yeah, I'm excited to see that wedding. It'll be fun. Uh, I can't wait. I hope we get some photos that we can chat about here on the podcast. I'm sure we will. I can't wait to see Olivia's dress. It's going to be a big affair. Well, speaking of Harry, uh, let's go ahead and chat about some follow up to the Nigeria trip. So he and Megan are actually facing some criticism um, Imagine following- that. <laughs> That's never yeah. happened before, right? Oh, well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> following that trip. Um, but it's regarding an airline executive that they were associated with while they were in Nigeria for their Invictus Games events. And it's being reported that while there, this uh, known alleged scammer and criminal was part of the group welcoming them to Nigeria. So the individual's name is Dr. Alan Aniema, and he is the CEO of the airline Air Peace. And this is the airline Harry and Meghan flew during their recent travels in Africa. He is, it's Dr. Alan Aniema, or yeah, Aniema, I'm not sure I'm saying that right, but he is wanted in the United States for bank fraud and money laundering. And it is uh, being alleged that he used false documents to illegally transfer more than $20 million from Nigeria to the U.S., I think back in 2019. Um, And he, I, I think he has denied these claims, but it took place in Atlanta. He used to visit the city pretty regularly. Obviously, at this point, he's staying out of the U.S. because he is wanted um, in this country. We don't know if Harry and Meghan were aware of, you know, his status or or his, you know, alleged criminal activity. But I will say it takes me back to the comments that I made last week, Rachel, when I said, you know, the royal family really has to be careful with how they draw distinctions between official royal tours and Harry and Meghan taking trips that mirror royal tours because, You know, if a member of the public is unable to differentiate between, let's say, a Harry and Meghan trip and an official royal tour by someone in the royal family, and then we have some sort of a scandal pop up like this one, you know, it could be really reputation damaging for the royals. And, you know, I read an article on CNN earlier that said, you know, the UK's foreign office has labeled Nigeria as one of the world's most dangerous countries to travel to in the world. Um, they mentioned it's got major security issues right now with a terrorist insurgency. And so I, I just feel like, you know, that's something that Harry and Meghan are going to have to think carefully about as they manage their image and their brand. And, you know, assuming they weren't aware of this scandal, I think their team's going to have to do their due diligence when they're scheduling these engagements with individuals in foreign countries, especially in locations where there may be a lot of corruption um, both Harry and Meghan have been very vocal about their safety. Um, you know, they've insisted on needing government security while in the UK. And so I just think there's a lot to consider there. Um, and I just wanted to point that out because that has come out since we initially reported on their trip. Mm-hmm. And I also want to point this out. So this, I actually just found out about this today. So the Royal family has quietly deleted Harry's statement about speaking of safety, about Megan's safety off of its website. So this statement, I'm sure that any and all royal watchers will remember this statement. It it came out in November 2016. Harry released a landmark statement that many of our listeners, Jessica, all of you will surely remember. It not only confirmed his relationship with Megan, but it also expressed his fears over her safety. So in November 2016, the two had been dating for about four months when Harry released the statement. And 
Now it seems that the royal family has quietly taken it down. So Newsweek confirmed that the Internet Archive site Wayback Machine, which I'm sure that many of you have heard of, I know I've used it, was able to access the link on December 3rd of 2023, but it was not able to access it a week later on December 10th, which indicated that the page was taken down during that time frame. That was five months ago. Again, very under the radar. It's just now kind of being noticed. So that page with the statement is no longer available on the royal family's website site the link is no longer active and so that state i'm not going to read the full statement because it's pretty long but the statement read in part prince harry is worried about Ms. markle's safety and is deeply disappointed that he has not been able to protect her it is not right that a few months into a relationship with him that Ms. markle should be subjected to such a storm he knows commentators will say this is the price she has to pay and this is all part of the game he strongly disagrees this is not a game it is her life and his so this actually if you'll remember we i know we reported on this back in march this follows another harry and megan edit to the royal family's website back in march so that was i guess two months ago their profiles were combined from two into one so um i found this interesting i don't know if there's any there there probably not but that if the if the page went down between december 3rd and december 10th that was i think like a, a end game Omid Scobie's mm-hmm. Endgame came out November 28th. So that was within days of that happening. So read into it what you will, but that was a pretty significant statement and it is no longer accessible on the Royal Family website. Well, in keeping with the conversation of security and the Sussex's relationship with the Royal Family, I also wanted to share another update, Rachel, since we last talked about King Charles, I know there was a lot of chatter about him supposedly not having time for Prince Harry when he was in the UK. And since we last chatted about this, it's actually been reported that King Charles did offer for Harry to stay at St. James Palace while he was in London. And I can't remember who I heard this reported from. It might have been Rebecca English, um, but Harry did turn that down. He chose to stay in a hotel. Just wanted to mention that, though, because a lot of people, I think, were asking the question, you know, why wouldn't King Charles you know, have time for Harry. And I do think it's only fair to show that he did make an effort. He offered for him to stay, um, you know, in accommodations on a royal property. And I've said in the past, I even though Frogmore Cottage is no longer available um, to stay there or, or for the Sussexes to have as a residence, I Really, I've always said I don't believe Charles would let them come to the UK and not give them a place to stay if they came. So Mm -hmm. um, I think it's really nice to hear that he made that offer. And I think it's worth noting that St. James is very close by to Clarence House, which is where the king and queen reside. And so kind of the insinuation is is that if Harry had said yes to staying at St. James, they would have had a chance to see each other um, because they were so close, but that did not happen. And I think the reason Harry gave was because of security concerns. So yeah the the saga continues but we actually have a really interesting we don't always get a listener question but we have one and so I think this is some it's a really interesting question to get into so I know you've got it to read yeah so I'm gonna read this and I'll let you share your thoughts first and I can respond but this question comes after a lot of feedback from royal watchers hearing that princess beatrice could join king charles for some engagements uh specifically it was related to the japanese state visit which well who knows when that's going to happen at this point but um it was in light of prince harry's recent visit to the uk being in the news and everyone's very aware of the arrangement that was decided between him and the royal family where the queen essentially said you know they couldn't do this half in half out working royal uh setup and so the question was can you share your thoughts on non-working royals stepping in to support the king in a half if a half in half out arrangement was deemed unworkable for harry and Meghan? Yeah, it's a good question. And so based off of what I have been reading and learning, I don't think that the half in half out method is going to work for anyone. That's Beatrice. That's Eugenie anyone. So Queen Elizabeth in 2020 clearly set a precedent when she decided that Harry and Meghan couldn't be part-time royals. I think that guidance is going to continue through to the York sisters, which I actually find to be a shame because Queen Elizabeth could have never predicted 2024 and how truly slimmed down the monarchy was going to be no one could have predicted 2024 with the absence of Kate sometimes Charles so I think Beatrice and Eugenie would be a very welcome addition 
to being part-time Royals, even on a temporary basis, as Kate could be out until the fall. As we said, she could be out for the rest of 2024, depending on how her health is and how her treatments go. So as I said, I think the precedent has been set. I think that the King will uphold that. I don't think that Beatrice and Eugenie will get to be official part-time Royals, even on a temporary basis. But I do think that in the interim and on a temporary basis, we might see them attend some events like, as you said, the Japanese state visit, if it happens on a one off basis or the garden party, for example. But I don't think it's going to be anything more structured than that. So both of these women, as we've said, have careers outside of the firm. I think that both have expressed in the past no real strong desire to be working royals. So I think we'll see them from time to time, but not much more than that. And as for Peter and Zara, being working royals will never happen. They don't even carry titles. And I will say that um, this is an interesting point to consider before the Harry and Meghan decision was made in 2020, nearly 20 years prior, Edward and Sophie were pretty much half in half out Royals before they became full-time working Royals. And I think 2002, they got married in 1999 They're, by the way, their 25th anniversary is quickly coming up. We can't forget that in June, but that's a whole other matter. But I think they were, they were part-time Royals until 2002. So for about the first three years of their marriage, but obviously the game, has clearly changed and you know I, th- I think it'll be interesting if trooping the caller does happen on June 15th to see if Beatrice and Eugenie are on the balcony that will be telling so in in my opinion my bottom line is I think we're going to see them at some royal events we saw them at the garden party I predict my prediction is we will see Beatrice at the Japanese state visit if it happens but um so we'll see them they'll be at the ready to help the king and the prince of Wales whenever they're needed they support the family they're proud of the institution but they're not going to they're definitely not going to be full-time or even part-time working royal and that includes on a temporary basis. So that I, I so the to answer your question, listener, I think that it's not going to be changed. It wasn't just some attack on Harry and Meghan. I think that the guidance will stand for everybody, and that includes the York sisters. So, what do you think? Yeah, and I think when we were talking about you know excitement to see Beatrice in some of these roles, I don't think you and I were talking about any official working capacity anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, but but my take on it is I do agree with you that a precedent has been made. I don't I don't think we'll see any official half in half out arrangement at least in the near future. But I think if it were to happen, the situation is very different for P- Princess Beatrice than it is for Prince Harry for a couple of reasons. So. First, I think that is a major issue of security. So Princess Beatrice and all the other royal cousins do not have full-time security and they're comfortable with that arrangement. So they're provided security when they're attending engagements, you know, on behalf of the royal family, but when they're off duty or they're traveling and working in a private manner, they do not have that. And I know Harry and Meghan would not agree to that arrangement. I think they wanted full-time security, um, both when attending royal engagements and in a private capacity. Um, I think also um, on that note, you know, that was something that they they couldn't reach an agreement with on that. So I think that was part of part of an issue um, Mm -hmm. with that arrangement. So the second issue is pay, you know, full-time working royals, they receive their income from taxpayer dollars and non-working royals, you know, do not receive a salary from taxpayer dollars. So I'm not aware of any pay structure for half in, half out royals. Um, I think, you know, when Harry and Meghan were senior working royals, their income was funded by taxpayer dollars. Princess Beatrice is not receiving a salary from the government. So, um, you know, and at least I'm not aware of, of anything like that. I'm pretty sure any money that she has from the royal family is from like a a trust fund, a private trust fund or something, um, you know, or inheritance that she's received from the queen. But I I think the takeaway here is, you know, if we're asking the question, why would Charles consider having Beatrice attend royal engagements in a part time capacity if that wasn't allowed for Harry and Meghan? I don't I just don't think we're comparing apples to apples here. You know, Princess Beatrice lives in the UK full time. She 
she is eligible to stand in on behalf of King Charles if he's temporarily unable to carry out his responsibilities. She attends royal engagements and events. She supports charities on a volunteer unpaid basis. Um, you know, she doesn't have this blanket government provided security. And I think that actually sets her apart from a lot of the other royal cousins, even Eugenie. I mean, you know, She's not full-time UK based. So I think that puts Beatrice in a position where she would be more eligible for that type of role than probably any of the other cousins. Yeah. And I'm, as I've said multiple times before, I'm all for seeing more of, of the York sisters and I hope we do, but I don't think it's going to be in any kind of official capacity. Well, Rachel, let's move on to Royals around the world. We've got a little bit to chat about. Yes, let's do that. A little bit of news out of Denmark. First of all, we have a new postage stamp. Mm, okay. <laughs> One was released last week in honor of the new King Frederick. And King Frederick celebrated his 56th birthday on May 26th. So happy birthday, King Fre- Frederick. Um, happy birthday. Last week, the royal family made a balcony appearance and they held a celebration at the Castle Square in Amalienborg in honor of his birthday. So on the balcony, we saw King Frederick, we saw Queen Mary, we saw Queen Margrethe, and all of the royal children. So Christian, Isabella, Vincent, and Josephine were all on the balcony as well. There was a really big crowd. I saw a lot of flags waving and photos and videos online. And if you're wondering about a royal birthday present... You know, we usually see the person celebrating receive gifts, but King Frederick actually gave his wife a present in honor of his birthday. So Mary received the Grand Commander's Cross of the Order of Dannenbrog. So what a present, Rachel. (laughs) I think that's a gentleman right there that gives his wife a present in honor of his birthday. I like that. I like that too. That's very sweet. I like that. So we've got another event out of Denmark each year. This is really cool. So each year the country holds the Royal Run. Uh, People all over the country can select a distance and join in on the run at various locations throughout the country. This year they just had it um, and there was a record-breaking 95,000 people that participated Mm. in this big run and the Royal family joined in as well. They were sharing photos all week online. We saw King Frederick and all four of his children dressed out for the run. Um, And then we also got a really cute picture of Queen Mary before a run. And she was posing with her two dogs that she called her running buddies. And uh, she said they couldn't join in on the race, but they were excited for her to go. And then we even got a photo of Queen Margaret, And she was at the palace sitting on the sofa watching the race on television. So I just loved how the whole family was involved, you know, in their own way. I thought that was really cool. I think that's a really cool tradition. I can totally see William and Kate doing something like that someday. I don't know if they'll adopt it, but that's pretty cool. You know, I'm not a runner, but I think it might be kind of fun to participate in something like that. I'm not a runner either, but if they accept slow runners, then uh, let's let's do it. On at least, I, you're probably way faster than me, but I, if they accept slow runners, I will happily participate. Maybe you and I can plan a trip to Denmark, and we'll we'll walk the. The road. more like I got to tell you, Denmark. Yes, we can walk. That's fine with me. The, I have <laughs> to tell you that Denmark wasn't always on my top list of countries I wanted to visit but the royal family is doing its job the royal family has made me want to visit Denmark so I will (laughs) happily go and participate as long as we can walk that's my stipulation (laughs) sounds good (laughs) we also have a little bit of news out of Norway so the Norwegian royal family released royal portraits of crown prince Hakan and crown prince met merit and they are so beautiful Rachel this is the episode of portraits yeah, all the po- all the photos, all the paintings, all of it. Yeah, I have thoughts on this, but yes, tell us more. Yeah, so we had some where they are posing together, and then we also had a few where they're posing separately. Met Merritt had one outfit for her individual portrait, and then in their joint portrait, so she's in a long red dress for the joint portrait and then in her individual portrait she's wearing what I think is a rewear of the ice blue dress that we saw her in at a past state banquet and the tiara she's got on in that portrait is the Norwegian amethyst purr so what are your thoughts okay so I have not been truthfully liking Matt Merritt's looks lately but she's absolutely stunning in in both of these portraits i'm just glad that the ice blue was immortalized for all time that it was the <laughs> 2024 royal 
women color um met Merritt looks amazing in red like that is a gorgeous color a gorgeous dress they both look great she looks great in her individual portrait as well uh, you know these these very fierce strong like um frederick and mary had this really fierce strong portrait come out recently out of denmark and and this is um the the one here is not what I would say fierce. I mean, they're both smiling in it, but um, it's it's very it's very powerful. It's a beautiful photo, and then Met Mary just looks beautiful in both of them. I really love it. What do you think? I agree. I think both of those photos are big wins. She looks beautiful in the red dress. I think the ice blue is very complimentary of her blonde hair and mm -hmm. um, her skin tone as well. And I mean, gosh, you can't beat the backdrop of the palace and that crystal chandelier. <laughs> yes. It's, I mean, that the, the portrait of the two of them together is especially breathtaking. That's gorgeous. I like how her dress matches his sash too. It kind of mm -hmm. just all ties. Well, while we're on Norway, here's a fun fact of the day. So Crown Prince Hakan's godmother is dun, 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 Princess Anne. The it's princess all connected. Royal. All connected. <laughs> now, I feel like we're always saying, oh, it's such and such as, you know, godmother, godfather. So to be fair, she is one of six godparents to Hakan. Um, he has some other royals thrown in there as well. But she actually took a three-day trip to Norway last week, and they met up for a joint engagement. Yeah, she went in her role as patron of the Anglo-Norwegian Resistance Commemoration Project, and they unveiled a plaque recognizing their two countries' joint intelligence during World War II, which is pretty cool. I know. I saw that. And I also noticed in one of the photos, there was a 100-year-old veteran in attendance for this event, mm. which I thought was really special. And I just always love seeing our royal families come together for engagements. Yes, I love that. Especially, I, I especially love it. I love it when there's any kind of crossover, but especially when there's a British royal family crossover with royals around the world. That just mm -hmm. completes the full circle over here at Podcast Royal. It definitely does. Well, let's hop to Monaco for just a second. We so haven't talked about Sunday. Monaco in forever, so I'm so happy to be talking about them. You're right. We haven't. Well, Sunday, May 26th was Mother's Day in Monaco. And I have to say I goofed. I So in the U.S., Monday was Memorial Day here. And the long weekend threw me off. <laughs> they So Princess Charlene shared a photo of herself with her twins, Prince Jacques and Princess Gabriella, um, on Instagram. And I posted it on our account yesterday. I shared it to our stories and I said, happy Mother's Day in Monaco. And it was actually the day after because I definitely thought yesterday was Sunday. Um, and it was not. So it was, but it felt like Sunday. <laughs> it felt like Sunday. Everybody's messed up this week. <laughs> yes. Um, but happy Mother's Day to all the moms in Monaco this yes. weekend. We also saw Princess Charlene at the Monaco Grand Prix and she and Prince Albert were Stunning, another beautiful red dress moment. So she mm -hmm. was at the Grand Prix Gala dinner and she was in a Ferrari red gown by Louis Vuitton. And Prince Albert was in a Ferrari red bow tie. What do you think about this picture? I love this Ferrari red. So listeners, you can't see this, but I my nail color that I have on my nails right now is called Ferrari red. I'm into Ferrari red. I watched the Ferrari movie. I love it. Charlene is so stunning. Um, that that is just a bold dress and I'm here for it. I love seeing her. She looks beautiful and I love that color especially. Yeah, so for listeners, I'll try to share this on our Instagram, but the red part of the dress is long sleeves, it's off the shoulders, but there's a piece that comes up over the shoulder creating like this uh open shoulder effect and it just looks like silver sparkly I mean it looks like diamonds but it's sequins paired with this red dress and she's got her hair parted over to the side and um she looks gorgeous yeah that is such an interesting look like it's just really compelling and yeah she looks gorgeous also really brief mention that Charlotte Kazrahi, who is Princess Caroline's daughter and Princess Grace's granddaughter was at the Cannes Film Festival. So we got a little Monaco Royal moment. Charlotte always attends the Cannes Film Festival. I think she's 
been there like every year since 2012 or close to it. So um, another Mo- Monaco Royal moment, we don't talk about them nearly enough. I need more Princess Charlene because she's clearly a fashion person and always takes my breath away. So she looks amazing. Um, so lastly, as we close Royals around the world and then therefore close this episode, I want to make a special mention here that when William attends the International Commemorative Ceremony of the 80th Anniversary of D-Day at Omaha Beach, which is coming up in early June. June, he will be joined on June 6th by 25 heads of state and veterans from around the world. And speaking of British royal family crossovers with royals around the world, obviously the Princess of Wales will not be in attendance with him, but William will be joined by King Frederick of Denmark, who we've talked about in this episode, Crown Prince Akon of Norway, also talked about him in this episode, King Willem Alexander and Queen Maxima of the Netherlands, and Queen Matilde of Belgium. So mm-hmm. he will be in good company. And then, as we said earlier in the episode, King Charles and Queen Camilla will attend a separate D-Day event. So that is coming up in, what is that, like a week or so. So that'll do it for episode 142. Well, thanks for joining me again, Rachel. I just love it every Tuesday. It's my Tuesday jam. And I look forward to (laughs) hanging out with you and hanging out with all of you listeners every Tuesday, even though this particular Tuesday definitely does not feel like Tuesday. It feels like a Monday. That's okay. (laughs) Well, thank you for joining us, as Rachel said. And as always, please come join us off the pod on Instagram. You can find us at Podcast Royal. We can reach out to us there. We do our best to respond to messages if you want to send us a DM on Instagram. Or you can email us at hellopodcastroyal at gmail.com. And please, please, please take a second to go follow us on um, Apple Podcasts or subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and leave us a five-star rating. We would definitely appreciate it. And thank you so much for tuning in to episode 142 of Podcast Royal. Bye. Bye. Thank you.